More than 70 years ago, on December 17, 1944, 11 black military forces were massacred in a cow pasture in the middle of nowhere in Warworth, Belgium. The 1st SS Division German patrol killed the men in cold blood. Two months later, a 12-year-old Belgian boy found their bodies rotting in the snow. When American officials came to examine the remains, they found broken bones, gouged eyes, countless stab wounds, and severed fingers. It was obvious. These men were tortured to death. They came from the segregated 333rd Field Artillery Platoon and were among the first military trained for combat rather than being put into services. This tragedy, however, stayed buried in the National Archives for seven decades. But this story is just one of many. We see plenty of movies of World War II that create this perfect little picture that all American citizens fought as a united front against the common enemy. But historical records show it was a lot more complicated than that. The Russians are able to push forward hundreds of kilometers within two months destroying 17 German army divisions. The Wehrmacht retreats towards East Prussia, leaving behind many thousands of casualties. During the war, more than one million black men served in the United States military, but they were treated as second-class citizens. Systematic racism and segregation were rampant. This meant that black troops, even though they were putting their lives on the line, still had to use separate barracks and segregated recreation facilities. If they were to step one foot outside their segregated units, officers would immediately attack or threaten them. For one thing, there's a deliberate movement among the cultural elites, the political elites, to uh, respond to Nazism and the whole ideology of Nazism by taking seriously the resemblance between Nazi theory and American practice, uh, the segregation of blacks in the South, the racial laws, and so on. And you have a burgeoning black-led civil rights movement moving for what's called double victory. They were not famous people. They were just everyday folk from different neighborhoods who volunteered or were drafted to be in the Marines, Navy, Army, or Women's Army Corps. This is the true story of what black soldiers had to endure during World War II. When World War I started, black intellectuals and writers discussed whether it made any sense to join the military for a country that did not fully recognize them as citizens. Around 380,000 black men responded to W.E. Du Bois' invitation to enlist into a segregated army, hoping it would improve the status of black people back home. However, many white Americans saw black soldiers on the front lines as a threat to the belief in their racial superiority. In a 1917 speech in the Senate, Mississippi Senator James K. Vardaman warned people that when black veterans would come back home, it would be a complete disaster. He said once you instill in a black person the idea that they are defending the flag and filling them with military pride, it wouldn't be long before they demanded respect for their political rights. After the Artemis, black veterans came back home but they didn't get the warm welcome they'd hoped for. The whites had something else in store for them. Instead of being acknowledged for their civil rights and contribution to the cause, they faced a strong wave of hostility and discrimination. White people speculated that while black soldiers were stationed in Europe, they spent most of their time with white French women. This increased their lust, which in a white person's mind, that lust was already dangerously high. So they posed a threat to white American women. In the years after the war, a minimum of 13 Black War veterans were lynched and countless others were whipped, shot at, or beaten. This ideology and hatred towards Black people persisted in World War II. Still, 1.2 million Black men and women came to fight during the Second World War. At first, these men were banned from fighting on the front lines. Instead, they had to do other services, like cleaning the living quarters and bathrooms of white officers. Quite like in the Civil War, it was only after the casualties began to rise that the commanders agreed to allow the black soldiers to risk their lives on the front line. In the meantime, 
all branches of the armed forces relied on Jim Crow practices. Countless training centers and bases were situated in the South, including the largest military facility for black soldiers, Fort Huachuca in Arizona. All bases had separate wards, hospitals, blood banks, medical staff, recreation facilities, and barracks for black soldiers. White locals, officers, commanders, and fellow soldiers would regularly harass them. The treatment they suffered was just gut-wrenching. Many of the people who fought there remember being treated like animals and staying in slave-like conditions. People would throw racial slurs at them every chance they got and would show them zero respect, either as human beings or as soldiers. Because white people thought that black men were not fit to lead or fight, most black men and women worked as cooks, construction workers, and mechanics. They dug ditches and unloaded supplies from airplanes and trucks. And for the very few who made it to the officer rank, they were only allowed to lead other black men. Compared to other branches, the treatment of black men in the Navy was among the worst. They were assigned roles as attendants and were expected to be submissive, wait on, and serve white officers. White people believed that if they were to assign black men combat roles, it would upset the ship's racial dynamics. They thought that black men were not able to fight as well as white men. But when the ships came under attack, even the mess hall attendants fought the Germans and Japanese. As a matter of fact, they proved to be excellent fighters. And so, a strange paradox was born. The Navy insisted that black attendants couldn't fight, and the historical records and evidence and black newspapers showed these black messmen fought like heroes when given the chance. The black press and other civil rights organizations started reporting on the hypocrisy of dying in a war that was supposed to be about democracy, while the black soldiers are constantly being humiliated and degraded in a segregated army. The Germans wanted to cash in on this golden opportunity. They printed out countless propaganda leaflets that said black people would be better treated if they just gave up on the American army and went to a German camp for prisoners of war. These leaflets said that Germans had no problem with black men and that there had never been any lynchings or beatings of colored people in Germany. So, if the black militia was fed up with the war and wanted to come home safe and sound, they should just be with the Germans. To understand what black soldiers had to go through, we also need to learn about how other countries treated black men. At the height of the war, about 100,000 black troops were stationed in Great Britain to support the Allies in Northwest Europe. While they were there, white soldiers and white officers treated them with violence, hatred, and disgust. But the British were a lot more welcoming. Well, we were, we were well received by all of the English. Birmingham or, or wherever, whatever city we, we visited. So we were well received because England had not seen that many um, black women, but they had seen the Africans. But we had a variety because there was 800 of us of 32 officers. So there was a mass difference in the, what they were being able to see. Back then, there were very few black people who lived in Britain. Most of the British had never seen an American, let alone a black person. Because the American military knew nothing about the British culture, they were given a handbook. Those who survived stated that the British were resilient and polite, and black people were treated as normal human beings. When the Americans came to the shores, a lot of the British were worried that Americans would undermine their culture. But many women quickly began to get close to the friendly and outspoken GIs. They gave the girls a good time. This is why, by 1949, roughly 100,000 British women married black soldiers. They left their homelands and moved to the United States. Slowly but surely, black people started to see a completely different side in white men. However, because white Americans treated their own people as second-class citizens, it was difficult for some British to remain neutral. On a local level, merchants and business owners were often afraid of disrespecting American segregation policies. They didn't want to lose American customers. According to Rory Odele, the first black war correspondent for major newspapers during World War II, when a restaurant manager was asked why he refused to serve a black soldier, he replied, white Americans say they will not patronize my place if black people were served. 
This is not to say that the British had no racial prejudice. It was just a lot more subtle than it was in the United States. It was just important for common people to make money and live a good life. It was obvious. The Americans wanted to make their white superiority known. So, the black men and women were constantly victims of attacks, beatings, and racial abuse in the British dance halls, pubs, and cinemas by white military police and GIs. This horrified the British public, who had never seen racism of that level. So, they started to resent it. Their outrage became known on June 24th, 1943. Here's what happened. The 15th 11th Quartermaster Truck Regiment, a mainly black unit, was placed in Bamber Bridge, a small town in the heart of Lancashire. Their task was to deliver supplies and war materials to air bases across the region. The black men from the 15th 11th went to grab some drinks at a local pub, but when the white troops came, they tried to segregate the pub. They showed the people that they put out signs outside three other pubs that read black troops only. The locals were fed up. They teamed up with the black troops and started a riot. Before we get into more details, please like and share this documentary so our people can learn about our true history. Schools aren't going to teach us this. It is up to us. Thank you. Now, let's get back into it. In the middle of all that chaos, a rumor spread that a black soldier had been shot in the back. This caused a manhunt. About 200 black soldiers gathered at Adam Hall and confronted their white superiors. Lieutenant Jones, the black officer in the 1511th, tried to calm them down. But when a dozen MPs arrived in jeeps and an armored car with a machine gun, the black troops took their weapons and made a stand. Over the next hours, Bamber Bridge was in complete chaos. Many soldiers were injured and a private was killed. Black soldiers were quickly blamed and taken to trial. In the first trial, four black men were found guilty, received dishonorable discharge, and sentenced to hard labor. In the second trial, most of the defendants were convicted of mutiny and disobeying orders. But justice came from someone they would have least expected. General Eaker, commander of the 8th Army Air Force, stated that white officers and MPs were a major cause of the revolt. He criticized how they mishandled the situation and neglected the injured. Because of this incident, it was important to make serious changes in the U.S. forces. This marked a significant turning point in how the military addressed racial tension. Now, when it comes to the actual war efforts, black people contributed a lot more than you think. The Navy also could no longer do without black fighting men, as the vast Pacific Island hopping campaigns brought huge allied flotillas up against fanatical Japanese counterattacks by kamikaze suicide raiders and surface fleets. Suddenly, black seamen were back in fighting action in the United States Navy. One of the most pivotal moments during World War II was during and after D-Day. This was the largest seaborne invasion in history. It started with the liberation of France and the remaining parts of Western Europe and laid the groundwork for the Allied victory on the Western Front. However, the necessity for the large artificial harbors, codenamed Mulberries, was still of vital importance. One would be constructed from Omaha Beach in the American sector and the other from Gold Beach in the British sector. Also, the large troop-carrying ships could only get within a certain distance of the landing beaches. And black Americans had a huge role to play. Approximately 1,700 black soldiers participated in the D-Day invasion on the beaches of Normandy, including a unit dedicated to barrage balloons. These balloons were filled with helium. They were anchored to ships or placed on the shore, floating high in the sky with mines attached to them. They served to prevent Nazi planes from descending to low altitudes where they could attack the beaches. The entire 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion consisted of all black soldiers. They were there to protect the ships during the invasions. But what many people don't know is that the black military played an even more important role after the invasions. They were literally the backbone of the American supply and logistic forces. The equipment, tanks, ammunition, and trucks handled by black troops. 
They were responsible for loading and unloading ships and other supplies tasks that supported the post-D-Day efforts. A particularly important group in this regard was the Red Ball Express, a team of truck drivers, with 75% of them being black soldiers. They made the U.S. military the most mobile force in the war. Their efforts helped the Allies defeat the Germans. So, when you get a view from a much broader perspective, you will see that black troops were not only critical in the D-Day operation, but also the entire war effort. The 761 Tank Battalion was the first battalion composed of black soldiers to engage in ground combat in Europe. The battalion joined General Platoon's 3rd Army in France in November 1944. During their time there, these soldiers played a key part in liberating 30 towns that were under Nazi control. Their service included 183 days in active combat, during which they also participated in significant battles, such as the Battle of the Bulge. Then you had the Tuskegee Airmen. In the 1920s and 30s, pilots like Charles Lindenberg and Amelia Hart were national heroes, but black people who wanted to become pilots faced a lot of scrutiny. It came from the popular racist belief that black people were just not capable of operating sophisticated aircraft or learning how to use them. Since there were very few black people who flew commercial airplanes, there was a strong resistance to black people becoming military aviators. In 1938, as Europe was on the brink of war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt expanded the civilian pilot training program in the U.S. They came up with an experiment called the Tuskegee Airmen to improve their armed forces and win the war. The army would give black people a chance and try them, but it was called an experiment because the army had no confidence that black Americans were going to succeed as military aviators. The War Department selected Tuskegee Army Airfield in Alabama as the training site. It was situated in the Jim Crow South. The trainees, who were mostly college graduates or undergrads, came from various parts of the country. The Tuskegee program, aside from training around 1,000 pilots, also provided instruction for nearly 14,000 navigators, instructors, bombarders, aircraft and engine mechanics, control tower operators, and more. After completing their training, these pilots were sent on different missions. The 332nd pilots started using P-51 Mustangs to protect the 15th Air Force heavy bombers on rails into enemy territory. Their planes' tails were painted red so they would be easy to spot. This is why they were called Red Tails. While the 332nd is the most famous, the Stars and Stripes, which is a military newspaper that came out every day, would talk about our missions. And they would talk about the all-Negro 332nd fighter group and how they had protected the bombers and how we were doing such a great job in protecting the bombers. Black aviators also served on the 477th Bombardment Group formed in 1944. Back then, there was a popular myth that lasted for a long time, which said that the Tuskegee Airmen never lost a bomber in over 200 escort missions. But later, an analysis revealed they lost at least 25. Still, their success rate was much better than the other 15th Air Force escort groups, which lost on average 46 bombers. By the time the 332nd fought in their last mission in 1945, they had destroyed or damaged 36 German planes in the air, 237 on the ground, and almost 1,000 transport vehicles, rail cars, and a German destroyer. In total, 66 Tuskegee trained aviators died in action during World War II, with another 32 captured as prisoners of war after getting shot down. But the white press didn't cover stories such as these. Back then, the United States had propaganda in just about every form of media you can imagine, except TV, of course. While TVs were available since the 1920s, they were not commonly used in households until the 50s. So they used posters, radio, leaflets, books, comics, magazines, newspapers, and movies to spread their agenda. The media constantly depicted white people as heroes in these battles. The majority of wartime propaganda materials presented them in a more positive light. 
which reinforced existing racial biases. This was especially obvious in the portrayal of soldiers, heroes, and the idolized American family. Black troops and their contributions were frequently underrepresented, downplayed, and overlooked. This bias representation not only mirrored the racial inequalities of the time, but also had lasting effects on the perception and acknowledgement of black service men and women in the post-war period. While in reality, black people were very much involved in the documentation of various aspects of military events, training exercises, and war efforts. Their work was used in TV shows, movies, and historical records, and more. This is William Scott, a black military photographer who helped document Nazi crimes in the Buchenwald concentration camp. His job was to capture photographs of official publications and press releases. He helped illustrate what was really going on in these concentration camps and the horrors that those caught suffered. Here is one photo that depicts the crimes against humanity. American troops, both black and white, are looking at corpses stacked behind a crematorium while inspecting the Buchenwald concentration camp. But there was one forgotten story of black American soldiers that remained buried in history for 70 years. And that is the brutal massacre of the 11 black GIs. The 11 lost soldiers were part of the segregated 333rd Field Artillery Battalion. They were among the first black troops ready for combat in World War II. The men came from the South where strict Jim Crow laws were already in place. These men slept in separate barracks, ate in separate halls, and were constantly dehumanized by white GIs. After completing their training at Camp Gruber in Oklahoma, on July 19, 1944, they arrived at Utah Beach in Normandy. The projectile is inserted and manually rammed. Maximum range for the 95-pound high-explosive projectile is 14,600 meters. Like traversing, elevation is manual from a zero minimum to a maximum of 1,156 mils. Since they were so highly skilled at loading and firing the huge 155 millimeter howitzer, they made an excellent addition to military teams. The howitzer was one of the most requested artillery munitions of the war. The black troops could shoot four rounds in just under 90 seconds and demolish a turret of a German tank over nine miles away. Sergeant Bill Davison, a reporter from Yank Magazine, was so impressed by their expertise and accuracy that he wrote they were the best artillery units under American control. They were so popular that soldiers on foot were glad that the 333rd Fab was behind them. These troops provided support for Major General Troy Townsend's US 7 Corps. The battalion actively participated in most of the major battles in France in the summer of 1944, such as the six-week-long Battle of Brest, the Haie de Putes, Rennes, and St. Malo. On October 4, 1944, the 333rd Fab was exhausted from battle. They were positioned in Schoenberg, Belgium. This place was close to the Arnes Forest, which was near the German border. The area was supposed to be peaceful and a good place to rest. In their minds, the war was finally ending, and they were to return home for Christmas to see their families. Little did they know that Adolf Hitler had something else in store for them. American, British, and Canadian tanks have overwhelmed the Germans occupying France. Throughout the summer months, fierce armored battles steadily pushed the enemy back. The German withdrawal was very chaotic. The Germans referred to it as the void. There was a lack of communication. The Americans quickly move on away from the enemy guns and continue their advance. On December 16, 1944, German tank forces launched a surprise attack on the unsuspecting Allied troops stationed at the Siegfried Line. They unleashed Neville Wolfers and heavy artillery. The well-equipped Wehrmacht soldiers, dressed for winter, outnumbered the Allied defenders by 10 to 1. They were vastly superior in terms of weapons and gear. American forces trembled. They were ripped apart, knocked down, and murdered. The 333rd Fab provided fire support with all the ammunition they had, but they too were overrun and captured. An American aircraft bomber attacked the group as they were being transported to the German camps for prisoners of war. In the chaos that followed, 11 black men managed to escape. They headed north on foot. When the 11 black American soldiers came down from the woods towards our house, 
They were wet and cold, and were hungry, and they asked if they could possibly have something to eat, upon which they came into our house. They walked for hours in the cold and were starving. That's where they stumbled upon a farmhouse in Worth, which was owned by Maria and Matthias Leinger, Belgium Catholics. The Langers offered them food and shelter and introduced them to their children. The black troops stayed with the Langers for an hour before German troops showed up at their door. A local German sympathizer had spotted the Americans and immediately reported them to the authorities. The black troops surrendered right away. They did not want to put the Langer family in danger. SS vehicle drove up and stopped directly in front of the house. The German troops then took the 11 GIs to a cow pasture not too far from the Langer's house, tortured and murdered them in cold blood. They left their bodies to bleed in the snow. Their story might have been lost to history if it wasn't for one of the Langer boys, hunted by the memory. In 1994, now an adult, Hermann Langer tracked down the names of the black troops who died at the pasture. He put a silver cross on the exact place where they died. Word of mouth spread quickly among the community. It eventually reached the Americans, including Norman Lechtenfeld, the son of a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge. Cynthia and I were planning to go to New Orleans to see the premiere of the World 11, the document, documentary that spring. Lechtenfeld and a few Belgians raised enough money to buy the cow pasture in Worth. In 2001, they established an official memorial at the site. Several years later, the memorial received an official dedication honoring not only the war with 11, but also all the black GIs who served in European theater during World War II. In 2013, former Congressman Jim Gerlach, with assistance from the U.S. Senate's Armed Services Committee, updated the 1949 subcommittee report. The revision included a resolution to properly acknowledge the 11 black soldiers of the 333rd Field Artillery Battalion. The 11 men received five combat decorations, some of which included the World War II Victory Medal, Purple Heart, and Bronze Star. Now, the problem back then was that right after the war, Americans celebrated and honored the lives of those who died on the battlefield. But what most of us don't know is that the black veterans at the time were more likely to be attacked for their services than to be honored for it. To become a soldier, one must first train with weapons and learn how to fight strategize, and survive. These skills gave black people power over the common folk. This terrified and infuriated white America at the time, which is why when black veterans came back after the war, they were immediately attacked by white people. Racial violence skyrocketed. It is in this hostility that we see how World War II meant something completely different for white Americans than it did for black Americans. Most white people wanted things to return to how they were before the war. They wanted to maintain their superiority. This is why the GI Bill, designed to provide benefits, was structured in a way that could not deny black veterans college tuition, mortgage support, and business loans. The GI Bill was a critical policy that helped veterans become middle-class citizens and get readjusted to life in the U.S. Like many of the governmental systems put in place during the Jim Crow era, the GI Bill, in practice, systematically excluded most African Americans. The bill pushed many white veterans into the middle class and created the perfect opportunities for them to achieve long-term success. But many black veterans didn't receive these benefits, mainly because they were distributed at a local level. VA offices, especially in the South, were able to stop some black veterans from getting access to education and job benefits. Also, discrimination in the mortgage industry made it even more difficult for black veterans to get VA-backed mortgages. But black people didn't want to go back to a country that treated them as second-class citizens. Many black veterans who returned felt they deserved better human rights. Being in the military made them feel more empowered and capable to stand up for themselves. They wanted to put an end to Jim Crow segregation and discrimination at work and schools. They just didn't want to live in a place where lynching and police brutality were part of everyday life. It was in this war that black people came to realize their worth. After spending time overseas and getting treated as equals, it was time to make a change back home. It's no wonder why many veterans, including Medgar Evers and Hosea Williams, became valuable members of civil rights organizations. It was the beginning of a new era. If you enjoyed this video, all we ask is that you like and subscribe to the channel 
to help spread our movement. And if you'd like to learn more about Black History They Never Taught You in School, the video on the screen shares just that. Click to watch it now, and we'll see you over there.